Okay, here's another video on my 2010 KTM 530 EXC Champions Edition. The goal of today's video is to check out the charging system from bottom to top, literally from the alternator through to the battery and everything in between. To help me, I've got the service manual on my laptop here. I also printed out this wiring diagram as well as the key that goes with it to describe what all these different components are. I've got a just basic multimeter is all you need, and then I will be going through where the different wires are, where the different checkpoints are, and show you how the service manual says to check things. So here we go. So the first step is to identify the wires that are coming out this, which is the alternator or stator cover. There's two bundles. This bottom one uh, has two wires in it, and it makes its way up along the engine over to a single connector with red and green wires. This is the crank position sensor or the ignition pulse sensor or the crank pulse sensor. It's called by a lot of different names, but it basically lets the computer know where uh, the engine is in its cycle so that it knows when to fire the ignition. The other bundle here has more wires in it. It makes its way up the same direction and it has a red, white, and red, black wire as well as yellow and white. This blue connector with the red, white, and red, black connector, that is actually the power to charge the ignition coil. And then you've got these two wires here, which are for lighting and charging the battery. So those are the pertinent connectors. We'll take them apart and do the various tests that the service manual specifies. So I have my multimeter in ohms, and this is an auto range unit, like lots of them are. The ohms values are given in the service manual. So the first test that it recommends to do is check the charging coil up from the ignition. So that's the blue connector here with the red, white, and red, black wires that lead to charge the ignition coil. So I'm going to put my multimeter probes on each connection, excuse me, each pin inside this connector. The value I get is 15.61 ohms, and the acceptable range is 11.98 through 16.21 ohms, so that is acceptable. Next, we'll go on to the next test, which is to test between the alternator charging coil, pin one, and a ground. And the service manual shows you how to find pin one. That's by orienting the connector this way with the snap release on top and that makes pin one on the right. So it's between there and ground. I'm gonna pull a ground just off of my battery, but you could go anywhere on the frame, theoretically, to, uh, to get a ground as well. So I'm gonna hold that in there, and I get no change on my multimeter, no reading whatsoever, and that's the specification. You should have infinite ohms or no connection whatsoever. Next, what we can do, is check the light and battery windings on the alternator. And that involves these yellow and white wires. So I'm gonna pull these apart. We're gonna measure the resistance first between the white wire and a ground. So we'll plug one probe into the, uh, kind of push it into one of the openings on the spade connector for this white wire and the other one to ground. The acceptable range on this one is 0.55 through 0.74 ohms. But I'm getting 0.54 ohms. That's 0.01 ohms below the minimum. With this level of precision, 0.01 ohms is, uh, is not something that I'm gonna worry about. So we'll call that one good. The next step is to test the light winding resistance. The way we do that is to measure between the white pin and the yellow pin. So once I've got that hooked up, uh, the acceptable range here is 0.127 through 0.172 ohms, and I'm at 0.25 ohms, so that's definitely high. That's in about twice as high as it should be. So we'll keep that in mind, and then we'll keep on moving on. The next test is to check the ignition pulse generator. So that's this connector with the green and red wires. We're going to measure between pins one and two on this connector. And again, I'm testing on the side of the connection that goes down to the alternator. These are little tiny connections and it's gonna be a little trickier to get the probes in there. Of course, you don't want your fingers involved in the measurement because your fingers will certainly change the measurement of resistance. If you're touching the, uh, across the two probes, you'll, you'll actually make a, a light human level uh, short across the uh, connectors. All right, there we go. 
So I'm measuring 109.6 ohms. The range on this one is 80 to 120 ohms. So right in the middle of that range or towards the upper end, but definitely within that range. Totally happy with that. And lastly, we can measure the resistance between the pulse generator pin one, which in this case is on the left side and a ground. So we'll measure between pin one, which is also, by the way, the green wire and the ground. And we're getting no connection whatsoever. That's infinity ohms, which is uh, the, a match to the uh, specification that we get in the service manual. So that's good. So I'm ready to put this all back together, but first I want to use a little bit of dielectric grease to help the connection stay free of water and dirt, that sort of thing. And I'll do that in both of these rubber covers that are uh, covering spade connectors. It's coming out very, very fast. I'm also gonna put some on these um, blue connectors for the ignition coil charge and the crank pulse sensor as well. You actually can't put too much of this stuff on, well, aside from possibly making a mess, but there's no situation in which this actually blocks electrical signals or power. It's kind of a misconception out there, but that's just not how it works. Okay, so with that done, we can put this all back together, and then I'll bring it back here for the one and only dynamic test I'm gonna run. Okay, I've got my multimeter in volts DC. It's hooked directly to the battery. I just took it off of the external charger, so it's kind of settling out to its preferred voltage. Looks like about 12.7 right now, so fully charged. I'm gonna start up the bike. We're gonna look for it to head up to a higher charging voltage. That'll tell us that the alternator is doing its job. And then we'll shut it off and we should see it come back down. So here we go. So we were at about 14.46, let's call it 14.5 volts with the engine at idle. As soon as I shut it off, we see the voltage dropping down steadily, and that makes sense. We're going to expect a resting voltage on a good 12 volt battery, somewhere around 12.7 volts. And uh, typically that's not even gonna be what you see in any used battery, and this one's well used. You're gonna see 12.5, 12.6, and it'll drain itself from there. But with a charging voltage, we're expecting around 14.4 to 14.7 volts. So this tells me with the engine just at the idle and seeing 14.5 volts on the screen here, that tells me the alternator is doing its job. The light winding did have about twice as much resistance as it should have, but for now, I'm just gonna let it lie and see if there any problem develops. The main thing I was concerned about is battery charging. I've had batteries go dead as just about everybody has and I wanted to make sure it was my fault and not the alternator's fault for doing that. So I'm going to uh, call this charging system good as far as the DC battery goes. I'm gonna be religious about plugging it in when I'm not on the bike. I'm also gonna to upgrade to a lithium ferrophosphate battery, LifePo4 uh, battery that will replace this one and it has a, a discharge circuit built in as well so that it technically can't die all the way. With the charging system checked out, now I wanna just check one thing on the discharging side and that is to do a draw test. The way you do that most easily is disconnect the negative side of the battery. Here's the ground strap that connects negative to the rest of the bike and do a current draw test between this point and the negative terminal of the battery. So let me set that up. Just like an automotive draw test, the first step is to move the positive probe from volt ohms over to the amp current port. And that's connected to the ground strap that connects to the bike. And I'll use the negative probe to touch battery negative, thereby forcing any draw to travel through the meter where it can be measured. So let's flip it on to amp mode. We should see zero or very close to it. And we do. So now I can touch the uh, negative probe to battery negative and there's no change. That means there's so far there's no draw. Let's flip on the ignition, because that can make a difference, and we still see zero draw going through the meter. I'll flip on a signal light now to create a load, because we do want to validate that everything's hooked up correctly. So there's just a couple LED lights that are flashing, and sure enough, we see a load showing up on the meter. So that's great news too.
we were looking for sub one milliamp draw here. So if I flip off the signal, I can show that it goes back to zero. This would have been one amp, 100 milliamps, 10 milliamps, one milliamp. And this is the kind of the threshold. You can see right now we're pulling 0.2 or now 0.1 milliamps, which is next to nothing. So that's really good news. The bad news is this is a lead acid battery and they're always draining themselves. So you really do have to keep them plugged in, but that's a slow process compared to some device misbehaving, some bad connection or corrosion, or some load on the bike being connected all the time and drawing the battery down much more quickly. So I've been able to validate that the charging system on this bike is working correctly and now also validated that there's no discharging problems that I need to worry about. So once I get a new battery in here, that should work really well and I can confidently go out on rides uh, knowing that I'll be keeping that battery nice and charged. If this was helpful to anyone else that has uh, the same bike or same questions, go ahead and hit that like button. But in any case, thanks for watching.